You're listening to Precinct 444, a podcast network from the National Law Enforcement Museum. Today we're bringing you an episode from Icons, where listeners are introduced to incredible people working within the law enforcement community who have made a profound impact in our world. These one-on-one interviews provide insight into their lives and careers so we can better understand their challenges and recognize their bravery, commitment, and sacrifice. On this episode of Icons, we're joined by guest host Chase Elliott, the son of Jerry Elliott, who is our featured guest on this episode. Jerry and Chase actually grew up with Madison Heitzenratter, the museum's director of visitor experience, and today they sit down together to talk about their experiences in law enforcement. Chase entered the field only a few years ago, and Jerry is now retired after nearly three decades working in a variety of areas in the profession. Tune into this conversation to hear from their perspectives as father and son and what led them both to pursue a career in law enforcement. And now for Icons, featuring Jerry and Chase Elliott. How's it going, Dad? It's going great, man. How are you? Doing good. Um, good. If you could just introduce yourself, tell me kind of your background and how you got into law enforcement and what you did with your time in law enforcement. Okay. So in 1987, long before you were born, um, I joined the Durham County Sheriff's Department and started out in the jail, working in the jail. And uh, after that, uh, after I went through the academy, when, upon graduation, they put me on patrol. And I did that for a little while. And then they actually came up and started talking about a program um, that we were going to try out here on the East Coast called DARE. And they explained it started in Los Angeles and Durham was chosen to kind of pilot it on the East Coast, us and a few other departments. So um, I was 21, 22 at the time and looked a lot younger than I do now. And so they said, you know, you'd, you'd be a great fit. The kids can, you know, they, they would look at you and kind of, you know, you would just be a good fit for this because you got a great person. You know, they they talked me into doing it. So I, I became a dare officer and did that for two years. And it, it was very interesting. I, I, I enjoyed it. I liked it, but I wanted to be the police. So, um, you know, they wanted me to do that. I didn't want to really do that. So the Durham police department right next door was hiring. So I went over there and uh, it was basically just a lateral transfer. I, I finished work one day with the sheriff's office and the very next day I changed uniforms and jumped into a black and white car instead of a brown car. And I uh, started with the Durham police department in 1992 and worked uniform patrol. And I enjoyed that. That was a lot of fun. I had a good time. Um, but after a while, all the, the changing shifts and, and what it does to your body. I mean, we would work days and then switch to nights and go back and forth. And we worked the DuPont schedule and that was just rough. Um, it was rough on anybody. So, uh, I said, you know, I, I really want to try something else. In fact, I want to try everything. And and so I actually sat down and, and wrote down, you know, I, I would love to do training. I would love to do bike patrol. I'd love to do SWAT. I'd love to do everything. So um, actually, I got to do SWAT with the sheriff's office um, when I worked there. That was the only cool thing about working there was during the summer when school was out, you were assigned a vice and you got to do SWAT stuff and go through the training. And so I, um, that's one of the reasons I actually did that. I, I actually got picked to do bike patrol and um, go through the school and, and work in downtown Durham which at the time it was terrible. It was nothing like it is now. I mean, it was drugs and prostitutes and torn down buildings. And it was just, it was terrible, but um, Mm -hmm. I'm amazed every time I go downtown and like, Oh my God, this, this is not the same place that I used to ride a bike around. Uh, After that, I, we, we started a unit called um, public housing and I, I joined that and we just worked the public housing communities throughout Durham I really enjoyed that because I felt like I got to make a difference. And what I mean by that is we, we targeted uh, and worked with children a lot. You know, the, these kids were, I mean, it's a terrible situation. Uh, what they have to live in, uh, you know, hearing gunshots just all night long outside the window, it, it stunk. And so uh, we, we would go in these communities and, and try to get all the bad people out, put them all in jail, get all the drug dealers out and make it where these kids could have a safe place to live. Uh, not only did we clean up the communities, but we also 
um, did a lot of things with the kids. And as you know, because you tagged along, we would take kids to Durham Bulls games, to Carolina Hurricane games. But one of the most fun things we did was to go camping up in the Army base at Camp Butner. It's oh, yeah. not really a base, but it's, an, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a cool place. We would go there, sleep in tents, um, cook out, play a whole lot of football and just have a good time. And um, I think that's where you learn to cuss as <laughs> he's hanging around his kids. I remember you come home and, uh, yeah, your mom was like, what did he say? <laughs> and, uh, but we had a great time, and I think we um, really got to make a difference in some of these kids' lives. You know, I, I just I have a feeling that we, we, we did some good stuff there, good work. But anyway, uh, to move on, um, uh, after working public housing for a while and doing a whole lot of camping, I decided I wanted to see what the detective world was like. And so I went to CID and I uh, stayed in CID 13 years. And while in CID, I got to uh, get sworn in with the U.S. Marshal Service and worked that um, violent fugitive task force for a little while. That was very fun. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Uh, I finished my career out in CID. I retired uh, um, in 2010 actually. And, um, yeah, so that was my law enforcement career. I got to do most of the action. I've skipped, I got to work in training and I really enjoyed that. I got to help out in the police academy. All that was fun. You know, I actually ran the academy one, one time because the sergeant had to take a leave of absence. And I was there doing, um, this, uh, 30 day, you know, you, you, the Durham Police Department would allow you to go to specialized units and, and work there for 30 days and see if there's something you'd be interested in. And I got to do that in training, and I definitely was interested in it and uh, worked under some really great guys, some really great instructors. And um, I've always enjoyed training and teaching and, and trying to teach uh, new officers to do things the right way. And, yeah, like mm -hmm. I was shown, I, I, I had great training officers and great instructors when I went through, and uh, it makes all the difference in the world. So that that's about it. I summed it up pretty quick. <laughs> Is a, a few questions just you touched on some things. Is there anything that you didn't get to do that you wanted to before you retired? And so I don't know if I should say this, but uh, yeah, I told you I rode bikes downtown. We would be assigned a partner and, and you would have to every six weeks work a night shift. So downtown back in those days at five o'clock it folded up everybody got the heck out of downtown because it was still rough well there were some kind of rough nightclubs down there so they loved to keep it you know the police presence down there um so you would be teamed up with with another officer and the two of you would work till two in the morning and and also work a weekend um so my the guy I was teamed up with rode motorcycles and uh you know i had my endorsement and everything and i said you know i'd like to ride a motorcycle so <laughs> um so I briefly rode a motorcycle for the police department. Um, but I, I, I enjoyed the bike really a whole lot more and, uh, yeah. it, it was better for my health anyway. So, um, but yeah, you know, I'd always thought about canine, but I wasn't, a, I hated running and these, these boys who did canine in Durham, they ran all the time. But and in fact, I asked one of them, I said, man, you, I never knew you was a runner. He said, I'm not that dog pulls me. He said, uh, he does all the work. I, I just hang on. And uh, I was like, well, heck, I wish I'd known that. I might have went out for that. But uh, probably canine. I, I, I kind of wish I would have looked into that. Yeah. Um, I will say on the few canine tracks that I've been on with, with my agency, you uh, you definitely see that a track's not just, you know, you're walking around, that dog's in full-out sprint the oh, entire yeah. time, and you're running with 30, 40 pounds of gear on, a gun out. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's really cool, really exciting. It's also scary, um, but <laughs> the the canine stuff's pretty cool. I can definitely agree with that. Um, yeah, but yeah, they the, those dogs will take off. The longest track we ever did, uh, a, a guy got arrested and put him in the car, and and the deputy walked away, and the guy jumped in the front seat and stole the car, and then uh, we chased it. It crashed. The guy took off into the woods, and I. I jumped out with, uh, the guy's name was Moses Irving and his dog was named burn and burn was an awesome dog, man. And, uh, we, we tracked that guy 10 miles and I remember running, I, I had to stop, you know, I got sick, <laughs> you know, I wasn't used to running that far, but, uh, old Moses, man, he never let up it, it, fast as that dog ran Moses was right behind him. So, uh, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that was a that was an interesting call. I, I do I remember that like it was yesterday. I kicked my butt. <laughs> we'll definitely get into getting some more stories throughout this, but going back to kind of even before you got into law enforcement, what was something that you know want, made you want to pursue the career? Um, can you kind of say yeah. what inspired you to? I wanted to, to be it? different. <laughs> what I mean by that is, you know, all my uh, mom's side of the family, all my cousins, all my uncles, they made the military their career. And, uh, you know, I thought that was cool and I thought about it. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and all my dad's side of the family, uh, uncles and cousins were in the fire. You know, they were firefighters with the city of Durham. And I said, yeah, I, I could follow the footsteps, but I want to step out and do something different. And, and back in the day they had something called public safety and that was where you did police and fire. And that's really, really what I wanted to do. And I was mm -hmm. so pissed off the day they disbanded it and broke it up into separate departments. Cause, um, you know, I don't know if you know it, I guess you do, but you know, my dad, um, at one point, um, he was a mold maker, a, a machinist by trade, but the company he worked for left and went, went back to Illinois. Well, he needed a job. So he joined the, uh, the public safety uh, Academy and he went through the entire Academy. Um, he, I didn't know this until I talked to somebody that I was actually in the Academy with them. Um, Roger Ladd, uh, Roger yep. said, um, our, my dad was, was number one in, in PT, you know, everything. In fact, he set a record on the obstacle course. And Roger said the last time I was there, his name was still still on the on the um board outside uh the fire academy showing he was still number one um you know for his age group and all that. But anyway, uh when daddy went through it, um, you know, it kind of I was about 12 at the time and he'd come home and he'd let me clean his gun and shine his boots and you know clean his uniform up and, um, get, get it ready for the next day. And that kind of made an impression on me. I was like, yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. And so, uh, that's kind of got me thinking about it. And, and, you know, I, I've always wanted to help people and, uh, as corny as it may sound, but I mean, I really did. And mm -hmm. I see, you know, that that's probably the best way I can make a difference and, and help folks out and help my community out is to serve as a, a deputy sheriff and a police officer. So, that's the path I took and I do not regret it. I'd do it all over again in a minute. Do you, uh, if you're anything like me, did you ever get any pushback from any family or, you know, any friends or significant others that you, you know, yeah. with? <laughs> so, um, I was, I was dating your mom when I went through the Academy and, uh, we weren't married yet. Um, no, she knew what I liked and knew what I wanted to be. And I, she thought that was cool. I think, um, Maybe it was the dude in the uniform kind of thing. I don't know, man, but, uh, um, she was all for it. And, and I'd never heard my mom or dad, you know, say anything bad about it. I, I know my mom said, well, he's so quiet. I don't know how he, in the world he talks to people, but she, she, uh, yeah, she just don't know me. <laughs> so I'm not quiet and I yell at people a lot. So, but she never seen that side of me, but, um, so no, no pushback whatsoever. I'll, I'll support. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd say so for me, you know, growing up with with you being in law enforcement and everything, I I didn't really know much about what you were doing at work because I was still very young. But um, I knew that your job was super cool and all my friends thought it was cool. Um, and I thought it was cool how I got to go with you to Durham Bulls games and go in <laughs> restricted areas and talk to the players um, and, and do all the cool things like that. So that that was really cool to me. Um and then for me, I, I, after, after that, I didn't really think about it as a career. I know there's a lot of people that say, you know, I've followed in my dad's footsteps and you know, wanted to be a cop ever since. And for me, it was, I wanted to be an NBA player, but that was obviously not, not working out for me. Um, so I went to school for exercise science, wanted to be a basketball coach, PE teacher. Um, then I started taking some criminal justice courses at, at your, uh, your suggestion. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, started learning more about it, started asking some questions, ended up getting an internship with the Raleigh Police Department. Uh, that was an awesome experience. Uh, tons of ride-alongs, tons of cool things. Got to see different parts of the police department. And after that, I was I was dead set on it. And, you know, it's, it's brought me here today. And, you know, same thing. It wanting to help people, but also for me, it's also wanting to see something new every day. You go to work and you don't know what your day is going to hold. That's um, true. You never know what's going to happen, which can be, you know, can be somewhat stressful because you just don't know what's going to happen. But it's also super exciting. Um, 
and the cliche stuff, you know, I like the idea of getting criminals off the street, helping people. Cause when people are calling 911, it's cause they're, it's, it's at the worst time in their life, their worst day. Um, and they need somebody to show up and, and help them in any way. So that's kind of, kind of my, my reason for wanting to pursue it. And I think there's some similarities that we have there. So what's um, your favorite donut? Favorite donut. <laughs> Try not to eat those. I think law enforcement shifting away from donuts and coffee. Yeah, it, 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 it was when I went through too. Yeah. I, I never understood that one because we, we didn't need donuts <laughs> who had time, but uh, th- this is so cool. We're doing this because I've actually never sat down with you and, and talked about this kind of thing and asked you those, these questions that we're going to talk about today. So um, I, I appreciate the opportunity from the uh, law enforcement memorial folks and for letting us do this. Cause this is so cool. Um, sure. Yeah. I, I was shocked actually, when you said you were going to do this, you, you were going to switch your, your major to criminal justice because um, growing up, you know, when I'd, I'd take you to school and I'd be hiding you in the backseat of the police car and you jump out and I said, hurry up for somebody. I, I decided um, not to mention that just in case. <laughs> <laughs> I think the statute of limitations is up. They can't fire me. I'm retired. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you jump out and all your friends would come over and like, Hey, turn on the lights, turn on the siren, you know, let me speak on the, on the um, microphone and, and all that. And um, you were just like, yeah, you know, I, I rode to school on that. I ain't interested. And you'd go sh- start shooting basketball or something. And all your buddies would be checking out, you know, my belt and the duty belt and all the tools that are on there. And, and you just wasn't interested. And I'm like, ah, he ain't never going to be a police officer. I don't think he's interested in doing this. So uh, I was surprised when you said you were going to do this and your mama was like, no, don't let him do it. I'm trying to talk him out of it. And I'm like, no, if it's what he wants to do, it's what he's going to do. I'm, I'll just tell you that now. Cause once the, the bug bites you, you're bit and you, you know, mm-hmm. it's like a vampire. <laughs> you ain't got no choice, man. This is what you want to do. This is what you're going to do. And, um, I hope you have as much fun doing it as I did. Please be safe. Sure. It's a different world now. I mean, uh, you know, I, I got shot at and all that stuff and I hope you never have to do that, but people are just, there's not the same respect for police. There was back when I went, you know, was doing it. So please be yeah. careful. I, yeah. um, Don't make me come out there and put my stuff back on. <laughs> <laughs> don't want that. Um, no, I know they don't. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've got to say in the, I'm coming up on two years, uh, sworn on the road in January working patrol and it's been, been awesome. There's highs and lows, especially, you know, with, with the schedule and everything, like you mentioned with the DuPont schedule, we, we do a modified DuPont and that's working every other weekend, but we do permanent shifts. Um, so when I got in and got out on my own, I was working permanent nights for about a year and a half. And I know mm-hmm. that can be tough on, on family life. It can be tough with your sleep schedule and just getting a good work life balance. But yep. I got to say, even with that and you know everything that I've, I've experienced and I've seen so far in about two years, it's, it's such a rewarding career. It's, it's awesome. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it another way. I just, exactly. I know I'm, I'm super young in, in my career and I, I still got 28 more years left. <laughs> um, but it's, it's been awesome. And, um, the jobs just, it's like no other, it's, it's something truly special. And there's a special bond between mm-hmm. you know, law Absolutely. enforcement officers of, you know, different generations, different departments. It's just, we all know what you kind of have to go through. So yeah, that mm-hmm. mutual respect for one another. Um, what yeah, would, uh, what would you say about, you know, as far as your strengths as an officer, um, what would you say was kind of your best skill set um, or attribute? Uh, dealing with, with crappy situations, I, I think. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a smart aleck by, by trade. Um, I got a PhD in it. And, um, you know, it, it's not always appropriate to bring humor in, into a, a, a situation. Um, I, I've definitely been to many where, you know, that was definitely inappropriate. But I've also been to a whole lot more times, um, like to a disturbance where if you can interject some kind of, you know, something to make somebody smile and just kind of, you know, that, that they're there thinking you're going to put handcuffs on them and you're going to, you know, talk ugly to them and you're going to be yelling at them. And, and, and when you come in there and you crack a joke or you say something funny or, or something they do, you know, you, you make them halfway stop and even sometimes smile. I mean, it, it breaks the ice right there. It's like, okay, this dude might be okay. You know, he ain't going to come in here and put handcuffs on me. He's cracking jokes, but, um, it it was to be able to get people, um, talking them down, uh, getting somebody who was very upset to, to just 
take a minute, take a deep breath, um, you know, take a break from what's going on, uh, separate them from the situation, but at the mm -hmm. whole time talking them up and, you know, not, not being critical of them, you know, because people have bad days and there's bad things that happen in people's lives. And, um, you know, I, I'm there to try to help them, not, not to keep, you know, bust them down and, um, you know, make his life even more miserable. So, uh, that's the kind of mindset I took into it. And when I went into the call and yeah, if I, I could somehow get this guy to quit cussing and, and just raising cane and just smile, or even laugh, um, you know, I, I knew right then I could get to them and I could, you know, um, start to try to make a difference and figure out what's going on and, and try to help them, you know, um, mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's what people need. Sometimes they just need some help. And, uh, that's what we do, you know, whether it's, it's, a, you know, something I can do, or, you know, I have vast amounts of resources out there in the community to, to fall back on and, and people that can help them. So, um, if I can get them just to listen to me and tell me what's going on, um, I can take that information and, and get him hooked up with the right situation and the right help. And, um, I, that's what I think I, I brought to the table. That was good. Yeah. I, um, I can relate to that as well. Um, for me, I think it's kind of the same thing. I think being a younger officer, uh, it has its advantages as far as a lot of the people that don't like us tend to be younger people, teenagers, young adults in their twenties that just have this bad perception of law enforcement. So mm -hmm. when I show up, um, it's kind of easy to relate to people because, you know, I, I listen to the same music. I, you know, I, I were born around the same era that are like sports, you know, it's super easy to strike up a conversation with anyone mm -hmm. that I've kind of run into. And I think that aids me in investigations, getting people to talk to me, um, and even just creating a good relationship with people, um, which is super important. If, you know, if you can get Absolutely. the people that you're you know, in the community to, to trust you, to talk to you when something happens, you can, you know, maybe find out, who's, who's breaking into this place, who's doing this. Um, mm -hmm. and it's important, you know, getting form and stuff like that. You have to be able to, to talk to people and get them to talk to you and show them that respect. So they'll show that respect to you. Um, and it doesn't always work, but mm -mm, you do your best doesn't. to kind of, you know, deescalate. And I know that's a, one of the famous buzzwords that we always hear nowadays with everything, but it's true. Just talk to people like they're people. Um, mm -hmm. you know, just because I wear a uniform and 40 pounds of gear doesn't mean that I'm better than anybody else. When right. I'm not working, I'm playing video games and I'm <laughs> playing playing with my dog, hanging out with my wife, just like everyone else is. So kind of that D, you know, breaking down the barrier, I think mm -hmm. is super important. And that's something that continues to be more important as, you know, society yeah, yeah. and everything gets, gets the way it is. I agree. Um, when, when I'm doing the, uh, the public housing, um, job, uh, I remember, you know, I, I sit in my, and, you know, just talking to myself, <laughs> what I wanted to accomplish. I wanted those kids that lived in those communities to, to see me as, as Chase's dad and not see me as a police officer. And that's why I brought you along and let you tag along. And they seen, <laughs> I was just a regular guy and, and they seen you, you know, you're regular people. And, um, I remember sometimes your mom would just go ape, you know what, because I would take you into those communities and, you know, we, we'd go hang out and, and do things, but you know, she was worried about you. She's worried about me, but she's more worried about you. I promise. <laughs> um, but I, I, that's what I wanted. I wanted them to see, I'm just a regular guy. I'm not officer Elliot. I'm not a robot. I'm not somebody there that's there to, uh, you know, to take anybody to jail. You know, I'm just, I'm Chase's dad. And that was yeah. my goal. And I think we, I think we got to, them. I think mm -hmm. that's what we showed them. And, and, um, yeah, I, I hope to goodness those, those kids turned out great, good. <laughs> so, yeah. And, yeah. And on my end, you know, growing up, going to private school, being kind of, you know, Joker. I was, I was spoiled. <laughs> I was spoiled for sure. Um, going to go hang out with some people that I probably wouldn't hang out with, you know, because our paths wouldn't cross. Um, mm -hmm. that was really good for me to just see how, how good I have it. And then, you know, as far as raising a family and like a law enforcement structure, I think that was, yeah. that was good in that aspect, just cause I was able to see all this stuff and, and talk to different people and just be grateful for what I have. Um, cause I know a lot of people aren't and yeah I, i'm guilty of the same thing when i was growing up but um i thought that was a real positive memory from my childhood going to things like that um oh, cool not just the fun bulls games but also you know playing flag football and everything and 
mm-hmm. you know, having, having push up and dip contests with, with all those kids. And that was a, <laughs> a lot of fun. I have good fond memories of that stuff. Um, I think you won some of those, didn't you? Yeah. Um, yeah I remember, I remember them talking about you, how strong you were. And, uh, yeah, it's like, you know, who you got that from, you know, <laughs> his mama. <laughs> um, as far as some kind of takeaways, maybe from stuff that you did on the job or takeaways that led into your personal life, what are some big takeaways you got from 23 years of law enforcement? Mm, I don't know. Not all of it was good. I mean, um, you know, I, I some things, you know, if, if you deal with something long enough and, and, you know, it, it rubs you wrong. It's going to affect you. And, and I, 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 it definitely happened to me. I mean, I, I, um, there's some things I'm working on, you know, personally still from that job that, you know, just people who, you know, mistreat folks and, and just, you know, sorriness and laziness and, um, just the evil people who go out and just randomly hurt people that, that just, you know, it, it got to me and, and, um, you know, it, it, it made me, it shed a bad light and made me look, look at some folks and that, that, you know, were, were completely innocent, but I just would assume they were up to no good just because of how they were dressed and, and all that. And, and, and like I said, I, I had to work on it personally just to know that, you know, not everybody, you know, just cause you dressed a certain way, don't make you a bad person. And it took me a little while to figure that out, but on um, the, the job, you know, just, it, it, it made me think like that. And, and then some of the people I work with, you know, were kind of were in the same boat and thought the same way. And, um, so personally I had to, uh, get Jerry fixed and, and get his head on straight and talk some sense into him. And, uh, I, I think it worked, you know, now I, I, I see people as, as, you know, I, I love the human race and, um, I, it took a little while to get there, but, uh, you know, that's one of the bad things I took from the job. The good part was, was the people I work with, uh, you know, mm-hmm. not all of them definitely were perfect, but, um, a lot of them really had a, a lot of influence on me. And, uh, I just, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, this is weird, but uh, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> you know, we, we, us old people use Facebook and we keep up with each other that way. That's what we do. And it's kind of funny. Uh, a lot of the guys that I hung out with and, and worked for and worked with um, now um, have have also done some soul searching and they're totally different people. And, you know, they they will you know mention religion and, and how, you know, I'm praying for this person or I'm praying for Israel. You know, everybody needs to take time out and thank the good Lord for what you got that make statements like that. And you, you would never hear that from from me or anybody else back in the day when we were police officers, we just didn't um, mm-hmm. come across. But it looks like um, after we all retired, we all found Jesus and we, we, we got our heads right. And, and now we love everybody. And um, uh, it, it, it's kind of neat though, to see how, you know, these, these guys and, and where they're at and um, you know, I, law enforcement didn't, didn't turn them into these mean, evil people like were depicted on TV and everything. They are genuinely great people who go out of the way to help other people. And they're still doing it even mm-hmm. after they retire. Cause I, I'm telling you, I still in my head, I'm still a police officer. Um, you know, it's just, it's never going to go out. You know, I'm always got my head on a swivel when I'm out and about, and that's never going to change. And, and my, um, desire to still help human beings, and, and to be a good person and, and do what I can to make someone else's life better. And that's never going to change either. I still want to do that till uh-huh. the day I take my last breath. And I, you kind of hit on it and I was going to ask it later, but I can, I guess we'll kind of segue into that. <laughs> um, I, I definitely understand the, you know, I call it the cop brain. It's, it's hard to mm-hmm. kind of just turn it off when you're not working. You, you just, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'll be going out to eat and you can't sit with your back to the door. Never, never, never. Oh Lord. Um, no. You can't, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I go most places with, with a firearm. Um, mm-hmm. and it, if I don't bring one, I, I just don't feel right. I feel, it's like not having your phone at this point. Um, but not also, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll, I'll look at, look at a suspicious vehicle when I'm driving around off duty and I'm like, huh, I wonder, you know, what's uh-huh. going on in that car, you know, I could stop it for this, that, and that, you know, or if I see an expired tag, I'm like, Oh, yep. I can stop that car. Just stuff like that. Um, <laughs> Handicap parking spaces. Just, 
drive you crazy. Yeah. No, uh, yeah. that's <laughs> not not more. That's not my area. But um, oh man, that that was my one of mine. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, talk about how um, I know. So when you retired, how difficult was that transition, kind of from going from cop to you know civilian life? And I never changed. It, I never turned it off. It off. Um, as you know, uh, when I retired, I I got my PI license, mm-hmm. and um, so I still got to do investigative type work. And so, I, you know, I, I was not looking for the bad guy, but I was looking for somebody who was, you know, screwing over an insurance company or, or somebody that was, um, you know, mistreating a child. I did a whole lot of uh, um, child custody type cases. So, um, you know, I, uh, I never got over that. And then um, after, you know, doing PI work and uh, doing all that traveling and missing you and Chandler growing up, I said, you know what, it's this is all fun. And I enjoy flying to Dallas, Texas and, and working cases, but you know, I'm missing my kids growing up and you guys were both playing ball and all that anyway. And so, uh, I decided I wasn't going to miss that. So I, you know, I went into uh, private security and started, uh, I was just director of security for a hospital. And from there I went to where I am now, which is, um, a manager, uh, at, at Carol Woods retirement community. Um, uh, overseeing security and transportation and safety and a lot of other things. But, uh, mm-hmm. so I'm still got my, my, I'm still dabbling in it. You know, um, a lot of the stuff we do there, you know, is patrol. And, um, so I, I still get to, you know, do that and still get to train officers who, who we hire. And mm-hmm. so, uh, I don't think I'll ever, you know, I don't think I could go somewhere and like be a mechanic or do something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm going to always, this is what I know, you know, and this is what I'm going to stick with until um, I retire and go to the beach. <laughs> um, so you, you mentioned it there too. Um, you keep, you keep leading me into the next questions. Doing great. You're a natural. <laughs> um, how do you think that your career in law enforcement impacted raising, you know, children and having a family life? Um, I, you know, I worked every off duty job that I could lay my hands on. And so, um, I wasn't home a whole lot. Uh, I mean, I was home some, but, but there was a whole lot I missed. I tried not to. And in fact, uh, you know, um, I, I when I went to CID, you know, that was a lot better schedule for family life, you know, it's eight to five. And so, you know, I still got to play police, but I still got to see my kids go and, and play baseball in the evening and or basketball or whatever. So um, I, I don't know. Um, you know, if I worked patrol, I definitely would have missed a whole lot. But, you know, law enforcement gave, you know, gave me an opportunity just to have it all. And so I, I'm, I'm grateful for that. I don't know if I answered your question or not, but. No, you did. Um, did you ever feel like there was some stuff that maybe, you know, what was bothering you when you came home and you found it hard to just kind of be at home when, you know, something was bothering you or did anything no. ever come with you? No, no. Um, I, I know what you're saying. Um, you know, all the time I spent doing this, there is, there, there's a few things that I still reflect on. Um, you know, there's some calls I still, um, look back at and, uh, that bothered me. Um, you know, I, I never brought it home and I never would talk to your mama about it. Cause, <laughs> um, I, I just didn't, that wasn't me. I kept things inside, but yeah, I mean, um, you know, as you know, now I'm on um, weekends, I, I work with a, a nonprofit called street safe and we teach driving, um, skills and, and all to, uh, folks who have gotten tickets and we work with the court system, but, the reason I do that, and these kids are 18 to 24, but um, it, because of a, a call I went to in 1992, and I remember like it was yesterday, uh, I, I was going into a curve and heard a loud, it sounded like a bomb went off. And as soon as I got through that curve, I saw a car that had hit a humongous tree, and the tree was pushed all the way up to the windshield of the car. And I jumped out and got on the radio, started calling, you know, send me an you know, ambulance, fire truck, everything. Mm-hmm. And um, I jumped in the car and there was three kids and uh, one of them was screaming and yelling, but two of them were, were unconscious and had really bad head wounds. And I remember taking their their pulse and, and one was in front and the other one was sitting right behind it, the driver and the person right behind the driver. 
and I was had my hand on their neck and and both at the same time did that long last breath where they blew it out and um man that just screwed me up knowing I was sitting there holding two 17 year olds that just took their last breath and so um uh that that has stuck with me and you know my mom now lives on that road and and for years and years I refused to drive down that road just because I would see that every time I turned onto yeah. that road and um you know now when I go to see my mom you know I have to drive past that but I I, I the tree is still there it's still got the damage to it I mean it, it's grown up over it a little bit but I can still see where that card hit it but um you know I I take that story and I go to street safe and I share it with those kids who have gotten tickets or who, you know, gotten uh, in wrecks. And um, I tell them, this is the reason I'm here. And, um, you know, if you think that you going out here and you driving like an idiot and what if you do get in a wreck and what if you kill yourself, you know, that, that has an effect on a lot of people, not just your family. Um, because every fatality I went to, um, I, I, I took a piece of that home and I especially took this one home and I, it's still here. So, um, Anyway, I'll get off that, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, man, th this career can, can, uh, have, have some, you know, kind of crazy effects on you. And that, that's one that I still have trouble with. Yeah, so. I, I definitely mm -hmm. agree. And anytime, you know, I, I'm a radar operator. So anytime I'm running radar or anything, I stop a teenager that's speeding ridiculous speeds. I, most of the time I end up taking the, you know, the, teaching appro approach you know i'm like mm -hmm. we have a lot of bad wrecks here don't want to respond to you know fatality where you're hurt you know you got mm -hmm. given some things to think about um plenty of times writing a ticket too just um because <laughs> that that carries its weight too um it that fixes the behavior but <laughs> um especially things with kids i i get that now with you know with a baby on the way um it's definitely something that you know makes me makes me think especially dealing with like domestics, we get a lot of domestic calls where children are sometimes abused and not to the point where there's, you know, being spanked, but to the point where, you know, parents are leaving injuries and, and whatnot on them. And it's, it's hard to keep your composure. It's hard to, you know, handle business and remove the human element from it because, you know, my, you know, human me wants to, you know, just go crazy and, and lose my mind. But <laughs> I know that, um, that's not what needs to happen. But yeah, I mean, as far as raising a family in the future, I definitely don't want to bring that stuff home. And then, you know, it, it's good that, that you didn't. Um, yeah. Cause I know, it, I know it's easy. I know a lot of people bring it home and that's, you know, unfortunately the, the suicide rate for police officers is skyrocketing because stuff like that just keeps, mm -hmm. you know, keeps yep. on keeping on. But thankfully there's a lot, a lot of resources now. I know at my department, they kind of push that on us. Like, we have critical incident seminars where we can go kind of speak about something if we've been involved in, you know, a crazy incident and, you know, or if you've been to some gruesome suicides um, or yeah. stuff like that, rat, bad wrecks, you can go talk to somebody You can go, you know, get help or figure out how, you know, you can deal with it and mm -hmm. it's good stuff like that. So you're not bringing it home and, and affecting family life. Cause um, that's, yeah. that's the last thing that, that anybody needs, especially, you know, yeah, your, your loved ones. Yeah. Okay. On a lighter note, in your two years, have you gone to a call or done something in law enforcement that has like totally knocked your socks off and it's like, that was some cool stuff or that was very neat or is there anything yet that, that pops in your mind that like that? On a lighter note, um, <laughs> something that is just something, something that, that like, you just said, like, man, that was a very cool experience. I'm glad I got to go through that. Or I'm glad I got to do that. Um, I mean, there's there's little things here and there where, um, yeah, I was working one night, and I, I pulled over a car, suspected drunk driver, kind of weaving in and out of the lane. Um, I ended up stopping him. It was this elderly, elderly man. He said, I've been driving around for the past five hours. I just don't know how to get home. Um, mm. So I'm like, well, let me see your driver's license. And I was like, do you still live here and here? And he's like, yeah. Um, I'm on the phone with my wife trying to figure out where to go and I'm talking to him. I'm, I'm it's at this point, it's obviously not an impaired driver investigation. He's not impaired. Mm -hmm. Just old and confused. I'm like, well, do you need a ride or do you feel like you can drive? He's like, I can drive. I'm like, well, you're going to follow me. I talked to his wife. I'm like, he's going to follow me. I'm going to drive and we're going to get him home. Um, and when I go. got there, he was super thankful. His wife came out and 
you know, I was joking with her. I was like, don't give him too hard of a time. He's been trying to come home. He's not trying to be late. <laughs> um, he asked for my business. It's not your he's cooking. Like, yeah, he's like, I'm, <laughs> I'm calling the chief tomorrow. I, I'm so thankful. I would have never got home. I, I might would still be stranded and, you know, could have potentially That's gotten a wreck because cool. I mean, yeah. he had been driving for so long that he was just, he was exhausted. And his stress level was, was off the charts mm -hmm. probably. Wow. That's cool, um, man. Stuff like that's cool. cool. Um, I mean, there's plenty of stories. Yeah. I was one night we helped, um, there was an individual who had called his ex-wife. He, um, picked up the daughter from the airport, uh, without the ex-wife knowing and said that he was going to kill her and then kill himself. Um, mm -hmm. daughter was like eight or nine, super young. Um, they were able to ping his phone um, mm -hmm. to some of the hotels around like RDU, the airport. So we uh, ended up going there with uh, some of the local agencies around there. They called for our assistance. So we showed up, uh, kicked in the door, which was just an adrenaline rush. Love doing that. Um, and then <laughs> him and his daughter were sitting in there and we you know, all made sure she was okay. And we all took him into custody. So stuff like that was rewarding, making sure that that little little girl was okay before she got harmed because um from what i understand the the gentleman he was a veteran he had pretty bad ptsd yeah um and he did did have a firearm he was going to um mm -hmm. or at least voice that he was going to end both their lives so wow um stuff like that i mean it's just like man you know you yeah. sometimes you don't get to feel like you're helping people in this job and i i know i say like i got in this job to help people but when you're pulling somebody over and you're stopping a drunk driver and you're arresting them. They're not like, thank you so much for your service. Like you're no. awesome. They're, they're cussing you out. They're saying, you know, mm -hmm. this and that and telling you how they're not drunk and you're a terrible person. And but the wishing, 25 you know, people that are driving past you that you might've saved their life because that yeah. person could have went down the road and hit them head on. Yeah. They're, um, they're, they're thinking it. I think <laughs> it's, it's important, it. um, mm -hmm. you know, to have that internal kind of drive and just keep reminding yourself, Cause I mean, I, I was someone who really liked to look for drunk drivers on night shift. Mm -hmm. um, Me too. <laughs> and I, I know a lot of people don't like dealing with them cause all the paperwork and whatnot, but it, it's super important because it's definitely not a, a victimless crime. I mean, there's plenty of people mm -hmm. killed by drunk drivers every year. Mm -hmm. Um, plenty of families, innocent kids, innocent, you know, men, yeah. women, children, all demographics. Um, mm -hmm. so something like that is just something that, you know, you know, it's important, you know, you're helping people but it's a thankless job for, for stuff like mm -hmm. that. You're not going to get thanked for it. And it's, it's unfortunate, no. but um, there's plenty of things in the career that are thankless like that. Yeah. Um, in, inside is rewarding though. Yeah. But it's also, you know, it's awesome to, to think that you are making a difference and potentially, Absolutely. you know, preventing a murder or, you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I got something cool to tell you about. I don't, you don't, you probably don't remember this because you were just born in 1999 and this happened in 1999, but okay. one of the, one of the highlights of my career. Um, so Durham police department had an honor choir and we would perform at funerals and, and memorial services and all. And in 1999, we got invited by the law enforcement memorial to do the candlelight vigil. And mm -hmm. we, we sang a song called, I believe in America and it's one of those like God bless USA. It just makes the hair stand up on your arm, and you know makes oh, yeah. you feel really, really proud. I, I'm surprised that song is not out and about and became famous, but it, it's a super cool song. But anyway, um, so we got there, and the guy who was in charge of the the memorial and the museum uh, came out and met with us. Said we're going to try something different. We're, we're going to do something this year that that's never been done. Um, he said, I got a, I think he said a recitation is what he called it, um, called the thin blue line. And what we're going to do, um, I've recorded it and we're going to play it over the loudspeaker. And about at, at one point, there's, there's going to be this blue laser that goes out across the crowd. Now the crowd was 15,000 plus that was out there listening to us that night. And after it went out of the crowd, it, it just spread apart and it actually covered the crowd and they had fog machines that were pumping in fog and uh you know that hit the light and it was just the coolest dang show you ever saw in your life and that recitation he read it's just it's the cool i mean it, it just it got to you i mean even before we started to sing you know listening to that we were fired up man that you know we were ready to uh to cut loose on that song and um after he finished we we sang that i believe in america and man that just i will remember that until i die that was just, the crowd i mean just watching in the front row were people who have lost, you know, husbands and sons and daughters, um, that previous year. 
And so they, they were, you know, feeling, you know, the pride of, of, you know, America and, and, you know, still, you know, to watch them cry and, and, and everything that, that got to you, but you could see that they, they really got a lot out of that, that thin blue line poem recitation, whatever you call it. And, and that song. And I remember after that song was over, man, you know, just crowd, just going crazy. And, and I was like, that was special. And, you know, I'm going to always remember that. And, uh, I got it on CD somewhere. I'll show it to you one day. But uh, so it's not VHS was, or cassette. Man, you lucky it's not eight track. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but um, yeah, man, it it was super special, and 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 I will always remember um, being a part of that. So anyway, so what are um, what was your favorite, least favorite parts? We'll start with let's start with least favorite parts of being a, a law enforcement officer. Um, I know there's plenty, but try to limit it to your top, top least few. favorite. Yeah, man, I I love the job. Um, I'm gonna have to think about that. Uh, I, I may, may, the Dupont schedule was was probably the worst part of it. You know, mm-hmm. the switching back and forth. Um, I would have loved to have done permanent either nights, days, whatever. But that was the worst part was just the schedule and the way it it messes your sleep schedule up. So can you describe what a DuPont schedule is for the people that might might not? Oh my know God, you asking me to think way back, man. I remember we would come on, uh, we'd start Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday night, be off Tuesday, Wednesday, come back. No, be off Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, come back Friday, Saturday, Sunday day, then be off Monday, then come back Tuesday night or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night, then be off. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then come back Monday daytime. We're at Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, which we called that hell week. Um, that was also the week you went to court and everything. But uh, Thursday night, when you got off at six o'clock, you were off for a whole week. So you got a seven day break. Um, so you basically fit a month of work into three weeks <laughs> and got one week off to recover. But all of us, of course, went out and worked all the off duty we could find. And because uh, we didn't make the money y'all make these days. Mm. Which is, uh, yeah, I started at fourteen five, so let that sink in, you know. <laughs> that sucked. It's uh, it's definitely still it's a, a different world, <laughs> underpaid career in my opinion, and in a lot of people's opinion. But it has definitely improved a a lot oh, more. Yeah. Um, I'm glad. I'm glad for you, for sure. <laughs> uh, my my least favorite, I'd say, probably the schedule. Um, I could definitely yeah. agree with that. Uh, we do modified DuPont, which is like I'll work Monday, Tuesday, off Wednesday, Thursday, work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then you're off. Then you work Wednesday, Thursday, the next week. Yeah. Um, that That's good. Now, when I first got on my own, it was permanent weekend nights. So <laughs> I would work Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, well, every other Tuesday. And then I'd, you know, work three mm-hmm. days the next week. Um, yeah, that, was, that was not fun. That was missing every weekend, you know, being, you know. Yeah. Out on, like out on my own in life trying to you know be a young adult and pretty much working every weekend but it was also a good experience because weekend nights is when you see lots of the interesting stuff at work mm-hmm. um lots of the in progress you know violent stuff and whatnot so right it was definitely a good experience and i think it's definitely helped me in my my career so far as getting yeah. experience and uh, so do you want to do anything besides patrol um i've i've put it on my list i um I'm interested in our, we have a traffic safety team. Um, I, I really enjoy traffic enforcement. I'm, I like getting impaired drivers. I like, you know, getting drugs and whatnot on stops, guns on stops, um, finding warrants on stops. That's kind of my, my main thing that I end up getting is I take, you know, I get a lot of warrants on traffic stops. Um, I like doing that stuff. I've taken plenty of class, like getting radar, you know, I've gone to LIDAR. I take a, took a, um, advanced roadside impairment class which you know talks about drug impairment and the, each of the drug categories and things to look for and you know that's like a stepping stone to being a drug recognition expert so i'm i'm mm-hmm. thinking about doing stuff like that but also i um i like the idea of potentially being in cid um the criminal investigation division um mm-hmm. maybe that i don't know drugs and vice something like that potentially something where mm-hmm. i still want to be you know getting into all the stuff, being young and, you know, mm-hmm. motivated and all the things. So I get it. You don't want to be a dare that, officer. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I like to, I like to stay busy. I like to, my favorite part of the job is being proactive. Uh, 
I, I lead our department in traffic stops for the year. Um, I lead the department in rest for the year actually as well. Um, not toot my own horn. I'm just saying <laughs> that's, right, um, right. that's no, what I man. enjoy. I, um, I got, you know, the area that I work is right off of a main highway. So I sit, sit on this little spot, um, that I have, and I just kind of watch cars get off, get off 40. And then when I see somebody, you know, do something or, you know, maybe they use their turn signal or they, they get over, you know, switch lanes to get away from me, creating distance, you know, the psychology behind that they're trying to distance themselves from police. Um, or, you know, if I see somebody look at me and go, you know, Oh crap cops, which has happened. Um, I look at that, you know, I try to get behind that car, find, you know, reasonable articulable suspicion to stop it, whether it be like a taillight speeding something, you know, some sort of infraction and then stop it, get up, talk to the driver, try to get my head in the car, see if there's anything mm -hmm. further. Um, and doing that, I've, I recently got, you know, felony possession of marijuana with intent to distribute, um, good bit of marijuana. I've gotten, you know, felony, um, MDMA, you know, meth, cocaine, stuff like that. And then mm -hmm. sometimes you find people with felony warrants for, for stuff. Um, just, you know, watching watching people and i like people watching off duty too that's part of you know that cop brain again just oh yeah you know, sitting there watching people and and stopping based off reactions and you know it helps to know the law when you you know all the motor vehicle stuff so you can get that stop and you know take that person off the street who's you know giving drugs to to teenagers mm -hmm. and and you know doing yeah, stuff and, that's harmful harmful for society um so that, that's what i really like at this point i'm I'm open to kind of doing a little bit of everything, like you said, just because um, there's there's so many roles in mm -hmm. in the department, and there's so many roles in law enforcement that I think you'd be doing yourself a disservice not doing a little bit of everything because mm -hmm. you never know what you like and unless right. you, you do it. So I really like the thing you said. You get 30 days um, that y'all yeah, kind was, of test it out. Cool. For us, we have like a yearly shift bid, um, mm -hmm. so I, I'm pretty sure you'd have to do it for a year. But right. I mean, if you absolutely hated it, maybe you could switch, but yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to so, figure it out. I'm still super young. I'm, I'm in no rush to get off patrol. Um, right. I think it's giving me good experience. I'm, I'm enjoying being on days now. Um, it's not, it's not yeah. as boring as I, I thought it would. I thought it would be, you know, oh, frauds, parking complaints. Um, <laughs> and it is, I mean, you'll go, uh, my neighbor's dog pooped in my yard and then I want to press charges. You show up to that and then you leave that and it's like, oh, armed robbery in progress. Like, it's, yeah. you know, it's something that, you know, it's complete, it's ups and downs in this career. Oh, yeah. It's just so polar opposites. That's, that's one thing. And you got to, you know, keep your adrenaline down. You got to try to stay, you know, even killed and keep your composure because you're just, you're going from something that's, you know, tiny to something that's mm -hmm. super, you know, adrenaline dump, you know, you're going a hundred miles per hour to the call and, just i think it's funny not, not quite that calls. fast you're gonna get in trouble <laughs> you're going at a undetermined amount of speed to a call um but yeah so i'm i'm still so, figuring it out um yeah so so all those people say you know ain't you got anything better to do than stop cars for a tail light or whatever um you know I, you can always bring up you know well you know because of that tail light being out I went in here and found all these these um, you know fentanyl pills that that probably you know your teenager may get a hold of and and may take an overdose or whatever mm -hmm. and so they they don't see that part and that was always my smart aleck answer you know that uh you know or I found this gun in there that he was going to use to you know rob your kid as he come out of the movie theater on Friday night so you know be mm -hmm. glad I'm doing what I'm doing. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they don't see the big picture, you know, they just think you're out there just messing with people. And that is totally not true. You're out there trying to keep the place safe and keep people healthy and happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I know through 23 years, it's, you know, there's a lot of different trends, but what was like a, a big crime trend when you were working, whether it was, you know, you were investigating something in CID or what was like something that was popular? Cause I mean, we've got, things happening now that's you know the trend in the past couple of years with you know the cars people are stealing kias and hyundais you know with the yeah. screwdrivers and iphone chargers and um now it's doing the same thing with dodge challengers um oh wow and then the vape stores one. are getting hit yeah so the and the vape stores are getting hit really hard um all in the yeah. wake county area so that's kind of the trend now um yeah what was kind of a 
the big thing? So or... I've I've worked on a couple task forces. Um, uh, one of them was all these um big office buildings that are up and down, up and down I forty from Greensboro to Durham. People would go in into those office buildings and still in laptops or anything else they could lay their hands on. And, um, I mean, it, it became huge. We, we gathered a group of us from Greensboro to Durham and all those small towns in between and, and created a task force and actually used to, you know, go and rent, you know, little pizza to crap cars and, and go sit in the parking lots and, um, look for these cats who are doing this because it got very, very expensive. I mean, they were, they were wiping out you know, everybody's laptop and, or, or anything else they could get their hands on, um, that was small and come to find out there was a group out of Greensboro and, and they were doing it. Um, I, we worked on that probably about three months and, um, every weekend <laughs> we were out there sitting, sitting in, in these office buildings. Um, so that was one thing, uh, we, other tr crime trends, uh, nothing really comes to mind honestly uh you know car break-ins have always been humongous especially in the summer um you know they're they're going crazy right now in the town of chapel hill we i got some alerts today from the police department telling them you know my, the community i work in you know keep your doors locked and make sure you take your keys out of your car um because there's, there's a lot of car break-ins going on so um but now that 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 uh that task force was probably the biggest thing I worked on as far as the trend that's going on or went on back then in the stone okay. ages. <laughs> um, so as we're kind of getting towards the end here, I'll ask you, um, what would your advice be to someone that's in law enforcement now? Um, if you have any advice or lessons that you learned that you'd like to pass on to not oh, only your son, but a, a fellow officer. Well, j just uh, remember you got a camera on you and everybody in the world's got a camera on them <laughs> in, the, in their hand and um, just try to keep you cool. And God, I'm so thankful we didn't have that. <laughs> but uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you that cameras has saved me many, many times. That, now, this is I've true. received several you know, Complaints. false allegations from people mm -hmm. saying that I did this and didn't this. And you, you play the footage for your supervisor and they're like, mm. well, they're lying. So, I mean, yep. come, nothing comes of it, but the camera, it, it helps way more than it hurts. I can promise you that. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, when, when they first come out with that, I, I, I said the same thing. Um, Mr., me and Mr., your mom was talking and she's like, well, that would suck. Everything you do is being taped. Well, well you know, it's going to save a lot more than it's going to hurt. And, um, and that seems to be the case, but yeah, just, you know, just remember that. And um, man, you know, I, I seen, you know, especially back, couple of years ago when everybody's protesting the police and all that and getting in their face and yelling and screaming, just, uh, keep you cool for that same exact reason. You know, you, you, everybody in the world's watching you and trying to make you lose your cool. So try to keep it. And, um, you know, just remember, you know, one idiot can, you know, you can, one old crap can ruin, you know, years and years and years of great work that you've done and great service you've, you know, given the, the people where you, where you work at. And, um, that, that kind of sucks, you know, it only takes one time, but you know, we're held to a higher standard. So just remember that. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Is there anything that you wanted to touch on or any questions you had to ask or mm. anything that you didn't get? to say that you wanted to you didn't tell me your favorite donut so where, where's your favorite place to get free food i uh <laughs> i'm just playing no yeah, trying to lay off the donuts i got um, you um chick-fil-a is always a safe bet when you're when you're working <laughs> the lord's um, chicken yeah it's um, the lord's chicken it yeah keeps I, you safe uh, you know you, you kind of answered all of them uh like i said you know we'd never sat down and actually had a conversation like this about what made you want to do this? Uh, you, you, you told me and that's cool, man. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you chose it as a career cause it's the best career in the world, in my opinion. So I'm happy for you. Just please be careful. It's a different world out there and people are mean, keep your head on a swivel. Don't ever let your guard down, you know, just be careful. Absolutely. Well, stay I, safe. I, absolutely. <laughs> I definitely enjoyed this. It was really cool to do this. It was an awesome yeah. opportunity. Um, thank you all for letting us do this. This was awesome. Yeah, thank you all very much.
Thank you for listening to this edition of Icons, featuring Jerry Elliott and guest host Chase Elliott. We hope you found this conversation enlightening and will join us again for another edition of Icons, where we introduce listeners to incredible people working within law enforcement who have had a profound impact on the community. These one-on-one interviews provide insight into their lives and careers so we can better understand their challenges and recognize their bravery, commitment, and sacrifice. The Icon series is not just about contemporary figures in the law enforcement community, but about all of those who have served their communities and the world, from now and in the past. Be sure to tune back in with us for future Icons episodes exclusively on Tuesdays every month to learn about key figures in American law enforcement history. Please subscribe to Precinct 444 on your favorite podcasting platform to stay connected and to receive our latest content as soon as it drops. We would love to hear from you. Send in your questions, comments, and feedback to precinct444 at nleomf.org. You can help us make our content even better. The National Law Enforcement Museum is located at 444 East Street Northwest in Washington, D.C., and is dedicated to telling the story of American law enforcement. We expand and enrich the relationship between law enforcement and the community through educational journeys, immersive exhibitions, and insightful programs. Find us online at lawenforcementmuseum.org and stay tuned for more podcast content from Precinct 444. Until next time, stay safe. We'll see you at the Precinct.